We Have Ways of Making You Talk presents The Cauldron by Zeno, read by Al Murray. Chapter 10. Bridgman realised that any number of Germans might be hidden behind the concealing bluff of the embankment. He sought out Gordon Brown and together they made a complex and close woven fire plan. His own platoon was down from 53 to 40 men. Brown's was in even worse shape after being caught on the Poles LZ the previous day. The platoon had the four Brens they had started with and another they had picked up on the previous evening. They had eight captured German Spandaus and about 1,500 rounds for each. Nearly half of the men were armed with Sten guns and the riflemen had captured Schmeissers as alternative weapons. The Peerts were with Blake for the only possible way open for tanks lay beyond his position. Alan was certain that Tim Jordan was right and that, true to form, the Germans would exert immediate pressure tightening their grip and launching probing attacks of company strength or more. The Germans would flow into the gap left by 4th Brigade as they fell back to join the division, and that gap was immediately in front of his platoon. At 10.30, and without warning, the Germans opened up with a spandau from high up in the big house. They hit two of Marston's men to the right of his Bren group, and they laced the house held by one of Brown's sections. Gorman acted in accordance with the prearranged fire plan, and his reply was instantaneous and devastating. Four machine guns opened fire on the tall building and every shot passed over the heads of Bridgman and Marston's Bren group. The gun combed the tiled roof and searched the dark recesses of the rooms behind the painless windows. They stabbed at the buildings round the house, their bullets piercing the wood and plasterboard of sheds like machine needles through cloth. The remainder of the platoon crouched in their weapon pits, holding their fire. Gorman's voice cracked an order high and clear, the two syllables ringing like trumpet notes through the roar and chatter of the guns and the whole position was suddenly still in the shock of silence. The men frozen in expectancy, their knuckles white on their guns, and the skin tight on their faces. The German machine gun did not fire again, and in his command post, Bridgman felt confident that the enemy would not attempt to reoccupy the house in the face of fire, which by its very volume would neutralise any movement in the building. From the corner of an eye, Allen glimpsed Brogan slip into the slit trench, which held the two wounded men. And then the Germans were coming in darting rushes, only occasionally glimpsed through the trees clustered at the far end of the grounds close to the embankment. The platoon's riflemen took snapshots at the fast-moving grey targets and Laverty fired slow bursts at where the enemy seemed to have congregated behind cover which protected them only from view. Allen looked to his right at Marsden's depleted section. He could see the butt of the Bren jammed into Laverty's shoulder and the Belfast man gleaming with sweat and excitement. A Bren fired from Gordon Brown's position and spaced out in the bursts was the odd round of tracer. It showed Bridgman that the gun was being fired diagonally across his front towards the back of the big house. Either the gunner or Brown was letting him know that the Germans were concentrating behind the protection of the house. He could hear orders being shouted in German. He waited for a lull in the fire and then called back to Murray to send down O'Neill and another man. While he waited for them to join him, he tried to build up a picture of how the German attack might develop. He surmised there was something like a company in front of him, but it might only be a scratch one and not up to strength. This meant anything up to and possibly above 150 men. The Spandau the Germans had put in the big house had been silenced, and he wondered what other plans the enemy had for covering fire. He could see very little movement now in the grounds in front of him, and he imagined that a considerable body of men lay behind the building. He thought this force would probably break from cover to their right, hitting his left flank on the road and track junction. He was glad Blake's section was in that position. He looked round as two men squeezed into the trench beside him. He spoke quickly. There might be very little time. O'Neill, try to pick up what you can. There's enough shouting going on. You might hear something useful. He turned to the second man. Get back to Sergeant Murray and tell him to brigade mortars on the lawn behind Company HQ. He'll have to fire them bloody nearly vertically. The range can't be more than 100 yards. Tell him to watch his ammo. There isn't much left. The man clambered out behind him, and Alan turned to O'Neill. Well, what do you make of it? Have you heard anything that means anything? The German Jew pursed his lips, and Alan knew he was going to be precise. He sometimes thought that O'Neill and his fellows were far more Teutonic than Semitic. It's hard to say, sir, but there are more than three platoons. More than a company, I would say. But I do not know how many men. One of them shouted something about mortars. If the next man who shouted was replying, then the first man was a company commander and his unit is of the Waffen-SS. Bridgman let out his breath in a long sigh. 
If what O'Neill guessed were true, then the attack, when it came, would be pushed home with a desperate determination. He had met the Waffen SS before. He looked at O'Neill. The man's dark face was still, the lips turned down and the eyes slitted, and yet he radiated a suppressed, delighted excitement. No matter what the outcome might be, O'Neill was looking forward to what was to come. Both sides' mortars opened fire within seconds of each other, and at first it was difficult to distinguish them, but Bridgman soon picked out the regular whine of the German multiple mortars, the moaning minis. The German bombs burst in the trees behind him and on the roof of company headquarters, and he saw the billowing earth where their own HE was landing, too far back, behind where he thought the bulk of the Germans were concealed. Then the bursts were nearer, and he knew Murray had a good observation post and had shortened his range. The barrels of his mortars must be nearly upright. The mortaring and counter-mortaring went on for some minutes. Murray's bombs were fired at intervals. The German fire was almost continuous and their aim improved until their bombs were bursting in the platoon position. Then the enemy fire stopped abruptly and Bridgman could see the heads of his men emerging at once from their slit trenches as they readied themselves to repulse the attack which must follow the last of the enemy bombs. The Germans came within seconds of the last explosion. A single, sharp order rang out and then the grounds of the house were alive with grey uniformed figures advancing and the air was filmed with the screamed Sieg Heils of the SS as they advanced against the equivalent of nearly 40 machine guns. For that range, the Stens and Schmeisses of the waiting men would be as deadly, if not more so, than the heavier, more difficult to handle Brens and Spandaus. Allen waited until the SS were ten yards short of the farthest cattle fence and had begun firing from the hip as they came on. He knew what to expect after his shouted order, yet no amount of anticipation could have prepared him for the shock, the incredible roar which burst about his head as every gun in the position opened up together. The advancing Germans seemed to halt suddenly, as if they had come up against something solid, and then they were moving forward again, their Sieg Heil sounding a different note, shriller and more disjointed. Allen had to resist a temptation to fire himself. He knew that once committed as an individual, the total absorption in conflict would cut him off from the battle as a whole. The German section tried for the open gate in front of Laverty and scattered like leaves in a sudden gust as the Bren gun emptied a magazine into their bunched rush. All along the length of the hedge and cattle fence, the German soldiers were struggling and clambering through to the road. Behind them, others were throwing stick grenades high in the air. One landed a few feet in front of Bridgman's trench and he grabbed O'Neill and pulled him down below the rough parapet until it exploded and the hot blast of its eruption passed over their heads. When he looked up again, he saw that groups of the enemy had got onto the road, but even the Waffe and SS could not face the terrible concentration of fire that was being poured at them. And as they came onto the second fence, Alan saw that the impetus had gone from the attack. They were perceptibly wavering. A few managed to clamber over, and now Alan joined in the fight as the SS men got close enough for him to see the despair on their faces. And then the survivors were running back, and their follow-up force was melting into the cover of the trees and the sanctuary of the embankment. O'Neill grabbed Alan's shoulder and pointed to the left. Following the direction of the extended arm, what Alan saw brought him upright, the upper part of his body well above the top of the weapon pit. Blake's position was a confused mass of struggling, leaping figures. The Germans had got through to him, and hand-to-hand fighting was going on in the slip trenches and the bushes round them. Alan leapt out of the weapon pit and felt O'Neill follow him. He turned his head towards Gorman's section and saw them already clambering out of their slip trenches. The sergeant was on his feet and looking towards the platoon commander. Alan had started to move up to join them for the counterattack when he spotted movement of the trees on the western edge of the company area, above and behind Blake. He shouted to Gorman to get his men back in their trenches and then, with O'Neill at his heels, he was running diagonally across the slope to join Phil Ramston as he showed at the head of two of his sections in a flat run down the slope to Blake's aid. Then, in a rush, they were all in among the fighting men. Alan had his sten in his left hand but he made no attempt to use it. The confusion was too great for automatic fire. Instead, he had drawn his pistol, and seeing a German climbing up from a slit trench, his jackboots pressing down on the crumpled body of a parachutist, Alan jammed his automatic into the man's face and pulled the trigger. Turning away, he nearly fell into another trench, the one that held Blake's Bren group. He saw Corporal Heibling lying backwards over the parados, his arms flung out and his helmet half twisted off his head. His lids were still open, but his eyeballs were already sunk in death. In front of his body, the gunner crouched, still firing into the bushes. Alan could not tell who it was. From the eyebrows down, he could see nothing but blood, the man's open mouth showing like a dark pool in a red desert. There were more besmocked figures than grey now, and the firing nearly ceased. 
Alan saw that Ramsden was accepting the surrender of a small group of enemy, and he saw O'Neill standing in exactly the same position in which he had first halted on the outskirts of the fighting. His sten was in his shoulder, and he was taking carefully aimed shots at any German sufficiently detached from the struggling mass. Alan had just decided that O'Neill's method was more constructive than his own when he saw the fair, unhelmeted head of a prostrate German soldier move slightly and the man's two hands close more firmly round his schmeisser. The soldier lay only a few feet from where Bridgman stood, but the SS man's head was turned away from him and the submachine gun he was easing forward was intended for another target than the watching officer. Alan took two quick paces forward and shot the man in the back of the head, the muzzle of his automatic only an inch from the German's hair. It was the last shot of the brief action. Alan found Blake and together they had a word with Ramsden. Blake was down to four men and it was essential he should be relieved. Ramsden took over the post temporarily and Bridgman and Blake moved back with the remnants of the section. As they arrived at Frank Gorman's position, Alan looked beyond it to Company HQ. He saw Tim Jordan standing up against the front wall of the house with the sergeant major at his elbow, lying extended on each side of them with the remainder of the men of company headquarters, their weapons in front of them and their bayonets fixed. Alan smiled as he called Gorman's men out and replaced them with Blake and his four unwounded men. Tim Jordan was taking no chances. He had been ready to take it in an immediate counter-attack himself had the situation developed badly or got out of hand. Alan signalled a brief thumbs up to the CO before leading the reserve sections down the slope to the crossroads. When Gorman had taken over the position, Ramsden took one of his sections and rejoined the rest of the platoon. He left the other with Alan to move back the wounded. Doc Barber came down himself to superintend the movement and Alan followed him round as he sorted the living from the dead. Corporal Heibling and Stuart, a German Jew born in Berlin, had fought their last and were put on the same stretcher to be buried behind company headquarters. Tony Hardy, the Bren gunner, walked back on his own, the drying blood forming a corrugated mask on his face. Jennings they handed gently. He had been shot in the groin and the right thigh. The f- his femur was shattered and the least movement had him screaming and sobbing with pain. They found Scruffy Butcher behind a bush, the contents of his haversack strewn around him. There was a cigarette between his lips and he was trying rather ineffectively to strike a match with one hand. He held up the other as Bridgman and Doc Barber approached. The forefinger of his left hand was missing down to the second joint and the top of the next one to it was hanging by a shred of skin. He looked pale under his dirt, but he managed to grin as they came up to him. I've got a blighty, sir, but you'll have to tell me how to get there. Alan Bridgman smiled as he walked on, but Doc Barber was not amused. I can't tell you how to get to blighty, he said, but Company HQ is in the house and you can bloody well walk there. Unabashed, Butcher shambled off up the slope, his rifle and haversack trailing from his undamaged hand. The German wounded were a bigger problem, for there were 16 of them in the position, and on the road in front of it. It took half an hour to get them back, and to carry the enemy dead across the road and dump them over the fence. Bridgman hoped that if the platoon were to stay any length of time in the position, the wind would blow continually from the south. Tim Jordan sent a patrol under the sergeant major into the grounds of the big house, They were gone for about 20 minutes, and during that time the waiting company heard five or six single shots at irregular intervals. When the patrol returned, it brought more German wounded with it, and two boys who could have been no more than 16 years old. These were physically unhurt, but the sergeant major had found them cowering in the bushes, their faces twitching and their limbs jerking with shock. No one bothered to ask what the shots had been fired at. Bridgman looked at his watch. The morning had gone, and the main task of the day ahead of him. <laughs> <laughs>